Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. this morning about what it means to be slaves heard the word about a slave but the truth of the matter is do you know that every single man or woman is a slave in a spiritual sense now if you understand the word of God you'll know that we are we're slaves we're either slaves of sin Or we are slaves unto the Lord, as the apostle put it. Slave meaning servant. We are servants of sin, or we are servants of God. The Bible actually uses the word slaves. It does. It actually does. If you look in um, Paul's letter to the Romans, he referred to himself as a slave of Jesus Christ in Romans 1.1. Amen? Amen. Let's turn there and just look real quick. In Romans 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be apostles, separated unto the gospel of God. In the King James Version, he's called a servant, but actually in other translations, he refers to himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. Titus 1.1, James opens his epistle. James, a slave or servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So most translations say servant or bond servant. But the Greek word, now watch this. You say, where do you get slave from? The Greek word is doulos, D-O-U-L-A-S. And it literally is defined slave. We call it servant. It's been translated by King James and others as servant. But the true Greek meaning is slave. So Paul would say, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a master to servant relationship. In other words, he is literally my master. He's the one I obey, no other. He's over me, and he has the right to be over me because I've submitted to his lordship. How many of you submitted to Jesus' lordship, and he has a right over you? See, you can't call him Lord unless you've submitted to his lordship. Hallelujah. John 8, 34. Jesus tells the unbelieving Pharisees, you want to look there you can john 8 34 he says truly truly i say unto you everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin well wait a minute hadn't we all sinned then what does that make us all if we commit sin we're a slave of sin haven't we all sinned so therefore we have all been slaves of sin We have been or we still are. (laughs) How many of you have been? I have been, but no longer do I practice. I'm not under, under the devil's lordship. I'm not. People say, well, I'm not either. I'm my own God. No, you're not. If you think you're your own boss, you're still under slavery to the devil. Because Jesus is the only true Lord. Amen? He's the only true Lord. But now, if we won't submit to him, then the devil will rule you. The devil will, the devil will destroy you. That's what he came for, to steal, to kill, and destroy. He said, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Commits there means practices. One of the greatest interpretations of the word commits that I ever got understanding about what that meant, because I had fogginess. I said, well, we all commit sin. So what's the commits there means practices sinning. 
If a person willfully sins, caring not that they're sinning, showing total disregard, even though they know in their heart what they're doing is wrong, they don't care. They're going to do it anyway. Okay, it's wrong to cuss. I don't care. I'm going to cuss anyway. See what I'm saying? That's practice in sin. Well, I know it's wrong to commit fornication. Hey, guess what? I'm going to commit fornication anywhere. I don't, anyway. Well, see, those people are still slaves to sin. They're still slaves to sin because they have never submitted themselves to Jesus. And he has not, and you do that by giving him, putting your faith in him in the cross. And then he gives you the power to become what you were meant to be. You have to first believe on Jesus, and then he gives you the Holy Ghost, and he gives you the power to become the sons of God. Amen? That's how that works. But it's by faith, not works. You say, but I'll change my ways. Every man that's ever said when he's a sinner, I'm going to do it messed up. You will mess up over and over and over and over, and you will fall over and over, and you will get nowhere. It'll be like you stand up and just spin into place and fall back down. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We must believe on him. We must adhere to him, trust in him, rely on him, depend on him, and what he did for us at the cross at Calvary. We must believe on his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He is our blessed hope. He is our redeemer. He is our refuge, our fortress, our strong tower, our soon coming king. Amen. But a lot of people have never submitted to Jesus and his lordship. Therefore, they are still slaves to sin. And their master, they will obey. We ask people sometimes, why don't you just quit? They're slaves. They're in bondage. The same way you and I used to be. I was in bondage and you was in bondage and we did sin. Many people are still in that spiritual condition today. But we were all, at one time, slaves to sin. Now we're either still slaves to sin or we're slaves unto God. Everybody's a slave. I'm not offended by it. I know what the Word of God says about it. That's the slave ship that concerns me right here. I'm free. You know, people can be free and still be in prison. If Jesus is, if you're a slave of his, you're free even if you're in bondage through prison. Paul and Silas knew who they were. You can shackle us. You can put us in chains, but guess what? We're still free. (laughs) Amen. They were able to laugh while they were imprisoned in bondage in chains physically by men and they were able to laugh at the day and praise their Lord can we help me God amen so Jesus is using this analogy of a slave and his master to make his point that a slave obeys his master why because he belongs to him those who belong those who practice sin belong to the devil by nature we are born into sin that's offensive to some people if you were to say that to some people today you might get I ain't the devil's the devil ain't my boss but that's what not the word says it says you're you're a slave to the master that you obey so if you're a sin who's the master of sin the devil from the beginning he was a murderer and a liar the devil he was Lucifer you have to go back he was a created angel by God he had a place and an office and a calling and, and an assignment but he, didn't, he wasn't content with that he wanted to be God 
and therefore he rebelled against God. He didn't like his calling. He didn't like his gifts. He didn't want to be that. He said, I want to be God. I want to be worshipped. Well, God says, ain't nobody else going to be worshipped up in here. And he was kicked out of heaven. He lost his place. This is, we need to all be content with what God's called us to be. Amen? Amen? Because un- discontentment led to rebellion. That discontentment, that pride in his heart, He was destroyed because of pride. Now man, by our nature of flesh and blood, has that same pride in us. Who's my worst enemy? My own flesh. I am my own worst enemy. I have to make sure I don't operate in pride and rebellion against God. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. And which we once did, what we once did. We want nobody telling us what to do. And it really kicked in in our younger years. You remember a time in your life maybe that you really honored and obeyed your parents in the Lord? And if they would tell you to do something right, you would do it. But they reached a certain age that they thought they knew more than you did, and they started rebelling and bucking you. We did. Began to tell lies to you about where they were at and what they were doing. See, we need to grasp them there in their early teen years, really. It says train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. So you can do all the training you want to do, and you're not guaranteed that your child won't ever stray from the Lord. Each person will have their own personal experience with God and has to have. Nobody can teach you how to be saved come on somebody can tell you how but they can't do it for you they can't make it happen you can't ride into heaven on your mother's skirt tail amen you've got to have your own personal rebirth experience amen so we grew up and at one point we began to rebel against authority And that's a dangerous place to go. See, Lucifer rebelled against authority. Who was in authority? God was and God is. God was, he is, and he is to come, and he always will be in authority. And if people don't like that, oh, well, it ain't going to change. He ain't going to change. Times ain't going to change him. Nothing's going to change it. So we can either get on board with it or get left behind. And I'm putting it out there straight. We can either get on board. I'm thinking of that song, get on board, little children, get on board. Amen. It's time to get on board. It's time to get on board, little children, and get our house in order and get our heart in order with God. Get right with God. Amen. People, if we don't get right with God, we're going to get left There's people going to get left behind when the Lord calls us home because they've never gotten their heart right with God. They've never bowed their knee and humbled their heart and asked God to forgive them of their sin and rebellion against Him and His authority. And that's the first step we have to take. Humble yourself as little children. I was a full 27-year-old woman before I really ever humbled myself before Jesus. And I had to pretty much take the rough road and come to the end of myself before some little light just happened to come on that I'd really needed God and a change in my life. So sometimes the broken road is the road home. Sometimes it takes all of that, if you will, especially for hard-headed people. (laughs) I think I had hard-headedness. I think I was hard-headed. But when we look back now, we were all looking to have fun. 
to enjoy life. There was nothing wrong with that. When I was a little kid, I loved to play and have fun. How many of you as little children, you love to play and have fun? Can you go back that many years? I got to go back like 50 years, so that's a long way. But I remember being a little child, and I loved one thing. To, I loved life. I loved getting up. I loved playing. I loved to go outside and play. I loved to do things. You know, I enjoyed life. I liked to ride the bicycle. I liked to play some basketball. I liked to have fun. And, you know, and then all of a sudden you realize life begins to change about those teen years and you begin to, you know, people get, girls start thinking about boys, and boys start thinking about girls, and generally that is an age where you better have instilled some good moral foundation in a child if you don't want them to be off course. Amen? Our children need to be taught right from wrong from their parents. Whether the parents are together or apart, each parent ought to be teaching that child right from wrong. And the standard from right or wrong must be the holy word of God. Whatever else we're teaching them that's not written is not beneficial for their eternal soul. Everything they need to know is here for the eternal soul. Which is what? The most important, right? Where does God hold the responsibility of training and teaching? On the parents. If you gave birth to a child, God holds you responsible, not the church. See, so many people want to take their kids to church just to be taught there, and it's good. You can have Sunday school, and yes, the teacher can help you teach. But the ultimate role of teacher in the home is parents. And not just mama, but daddy. Not just daddy, but mama. We both hold that responsibility before who? God's going to hold us responsible. This is what I read Wednesday night. If you stumble or offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it were better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were cast into the depths of the sea than to mess up one of my little ones. I tell you what, parents, that word that right there just will do some shaking. If we live an ungodly life in front of our children... We're putting a stumbling block in front of them. I thank God that he got a hold of me when mine were young. When our children were young, that's when God really stepped into my life. Three, four, five, right in that age. And thank God... I came to my senses and escaped the snare of the devil. Do you hear that? We were in captivity. The devil had laid a snare for our life in the early years. Come on. And we had fallen into the snare. You too. I know y'all. We had all fallen into that trap in our early years. Mostly around the ages of 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, right in there. Those are critical years for your children. And you need to know the Lord very well so that you can equip them, so that you can train them, and not only tell them what to do, show them. They ought to be in our homes, and they ought to be seeing us living a Christian life in the house. Right? So the sooner, the better. If we have children, we definitely need to know, be servants of the Lord's at that time and still not servants of the devil. Amen? Still not serving sin and being slaves of sin because, see, our children are going to be servants and slaves of sin as well. But have you ever met parents that they're not in the Lord but their children are believers and they want to go to church and the bus goes by and picks them up because mom and daddy don't take them to church? 
Mom and Daddy says, I ain't going because I'm not living right, but you can go to church and send them on a bus. See, that child is a believer in the Lord, and they love the Lord. Little children, most children love the Lord. I've never seen a child that says, I don't love the Lord. I think they come right out of heaven, and they're just fresh. You know, they're just, they've done left the splendor of heaven to come here. I just think they're just so precious that they, they're just, you know, they just have a lot of love and love the Lord, and they'll pray the prayer of faith. They're just really amazing. Children are amazing. But when we look at it, that's God's children. That's not your child. I don't care who we look at in this room. My children are not my children. God is just giving you your children for a season to train them up in him. They're your first disciples. My God. That's why it says charity begins at home. And I didn't know what I was going to preach today. I love it when the Holy Ghost just gives us what we need. He gives us what we need. Sometimes we just need a call to remembrance. We already knew it. No fresh revelation here. I already knew all this. But sometimes we have to remind ourselves lest we what? Forget. I got to remember who my first commission is to. Wait a minute, I'm going to go out here and save the world. Wait a minute, my house is falling apart. <laughs> Come on, I'm going to go save India. Uh oh, my house is falling apart. This is how we think sometimes, though. Slaves have no will of their own. Slaves have no will of their own. They're in bondage to their masters. And when sin is our master, we are absolutely unable to resist it. You say, well, I'll resist it. No, you won't. When slave is a master, you cannot resist it. You will sin. You cannot resist it because there is masters. And whoever we are servants to, we are slaves to, we are not able to resist it. So we are literally in bondage to our masters. That's why we're called bond servants. Paul said, I'm a bond servant. I'm in bondage to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He counted himself as a, bond, a, a bound to serve. You know, like, determined, I am bound, I am determined to serve the Lord. Amen? And his allegiance was to the Lord, as ours should be. By the power of Christ to overcome the power of sin, we have been set free from sin, and we have become slaves to righteousness. Turn with me to Romans 6. Romans 6. Let's begin. Oh, this is so good. Let's start in verse 1. For what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in sin? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Know this, that our old man is what? Crucified with him. That old sinful man, that Adamic nature, the nature of Adam, the flesh and the blood, the sinful nature is crucified with Christ. We no longer live to sin. The life we now live, we live unto God, unto righteousness, to do the right thing, not the wrong thing. That the body of sin 
might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. See there, we're not servants of sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. So if we have died with Christ, if we are crucified with Christ, we reckon ourselves. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Neither does the word say sin. It says sin shall not have dominion over us. Amen. For in that he died, he died unto sin how many times? Once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God, and that is forevermore. Likewise, do this. Consider yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. I want you to stop just a minute. I want you right now to reckon yourselves as dead unto sin. Dead means to exist, to cease to exist to live. I cease to exist to live to sin. Rather, I live unto Christ. Amen? So you're to reckon yourselves, you just say, that old Billy is dead. That old Jamie is dead. That old Sharon is dead. She died. When you get born again by faith in Christ, by his amazing grace, you get born again, that old person dies. That old man is crucified with Christ. You are to consider yourself, that old person dead. You no longer live that way. You no longer practice sin. You're no longer a slave of sin. Satan is no longer your master. You renounce him. You denounce him. He is no longer over you. You don't have to have... You know, no longer shall sin have dominion over me. Even death does not have dominion over me. Death does no longer have dominion over you. Because Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. Now, he had power over death. He does have power over death. But Jesus took it away. And all who are in Christ, who will believe on Jesus, they also, we also... Death does not have dominion over us. In him, we're free. I said in him, we're free. You rejoice today. You're free. When, 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 when you do or I do what we call die, if you, get her, if you go on and hear Sharon died, I'm not dead. I'm very much alive. My body they may have put in the ground, but my spirit and soul came out of that body. And I'm with the Lord. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we go to be with the Lord. Amen. If he's Lord, then we go to be where he is. Now, if we've never submitted to his lordship and we've been slaves of Satan because we've continued to serve sin and let it be our master, then we're going to be with the devil for eternity. Every man, when he leaves this world, is going to be with the Lord for eternity or going to be with the devil in the lake of fire and brimstone forever. That's the truth. You say, I don't believe it. That's your prerogative. We don't have to believe it, but the truth will not change. God's word stays the same. He says, reckon yourself, verse 11, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Don't yield your mouth, your hands, your feet, your body, any of your members, even your mind, do not let your members of your body be used as instruments of unrighteousness, but of righteousness unto the Lord. This is Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, for this is our most reasonable service. Servants, servants, service. What's our most reasonable service? That we present our bodies to God, that God may use us 
for righteousness. That we may live and practice righteous lives and speak righteously and think righteously. Amen. He changes everything. We become a brand new creation. People see you that knew you 20 years ago and they say, hey, how you doing? I know you. And you say, no, she died. You don't know me anymore. I'm a brand new creation. That old Sharon died. That old person died. Literally, in a spiritual sense, it happened. Death took place. That life may come. We have died with Christ, and we are seated together with him in heavenly places already. How can we, how can we not be dead and be seated together with him in heavenly places right now? Amen. He's already risen. If you be risen with Christ, Colossians 3, if you be risen with Christ, come on, you, we're already there. In a sense of spiritual, we're already, in a sense of spiritual, in the presence of the Lord. Because the presence of the Lord is in us. How are you in the presence of the Lord? Because you're not way up there. No, but his spirit resides in me. I am in Christ and he is in me. Oh, I love God's plan. It is magnificent. God's plan for us and saving us is magnificent. I just wish the whole world got it. I wish everybody could get it. And they can. If they'll just hear the gospel, if we'll just preach the good news that they may have something to believe on, how can a man believe unless he hear? How can he hear unless we preach? How can we preach except our master send us? Pray ye to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest for the field. The, 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 the harvest is plenty. But the laborers are few. There's few people working the fields truly for God these days. We need more laborers. I believe God needs more laborers. How many of you have ever said this? I don't know where to go and I don't know what else to do. Let me, hold on. Sometimes I'll tell God, I'm just doing all I know to do. I'm, I'm reaching who will listen. I'm, I'm, I'm posting. I'm sharing. I, you know, I... I, I do all I know to do. But you know, when we've done all that we know to do and our heart is open to God, and we get up and we present our bodies to Him and say, Here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. Was it Ezekiel? He said, I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm undone. I, I'm not worthy, but here I am. If you want to use me, I'm willing to go. He didn't claim to be anything special that God should pick me. <laughs> I'm not anything special that God should pick me, but if he would like to use me, it's fine with me. I would love to be used of God. Make me what I ought to be that you can use me. Make me a vessel of honor. Maybe we should pray more. God, make me a vessel of honor that I may be able to use in greater ways for you. Because he said in a house... There's different vessels. Some are for greater use and some are for not so much of great use. Some are out of, built out of wood and stone and some are out of gold and silver. I believe this. The more that we dedicate and consecrate our hearts and lives unto the Lord, the greater God will be able to use us. The more we die to self, the more God will be able to use us because we can still resist God's will even though we're born again. Did you know that? Paul wrestled with it. He talked about wrestling with his flesh. Why? Because you still live in a fleshly body. So you're still going to wrestle with that. He said the struggle's real. But look what he did. But look what all he did. He had struggles, but he still did more than any other apostle concerning ministering to the church. But he had the same struggles we have. What excuses do we have? 
Amen. Once we come to Christ in repentance, and once we've received forgiveness of our sins, we are empowered by the Holy Ghost. He says, I will give you my spirit, and he shall dwell in you. And you will have the power necessary to become the sons of God. The Holy Spirit is the power. He is the one who makes us what we ought to be. He's the one who changes us. Amen? It's the Holy Ghost. And it's by his power that we are able to resist sin. It is not by my power because in my power, that's flesh and blood. My flesh and blood will not resist it. It will do it. Only by the Spirit's power do I have the power necessary to resist the sin. That's it. That's why I'll go around, Holy Spirit, help me. You know, sometimes you're like, help me, I'm fixing to get in the flesh over here. And you don't want to anymore. You don't want to yield your members to the flesh and say stuff you ought not to. You don't want to submit your body in any way that the devil might get to use you. You know, sometimes I'll say, Lord, don't let the devil use me. Please don't let the devil ever use me. But you know what? The devil still use some believers. The devil will use a believer. If we're not careful. I said if we're not careful, the devil will use us. He'll use us to hurt people. He'll use us to gossip about people. He'll use us to hate on people. He'll use us to do all kind of things. Have you ever caught yourself and you realized that the devil was using you? And you repented right then and there and said, Lord, forgive me. I am sitting here just a gossiping. And, and the devil's using my mouth to tear down people behind their backs. I'm getting real. I'm real. Yeah, we've all struggled with being righteous. It's not as easy as it sounds sometimes. In a spiritual sense, we are in right standing with God. But while we still live in a fleshly body, we do wrestle. Because our flesh still wants to be in control. And there is such a temptation. If it's to repeat a matter that we shouldn't. If it's to, if it's to hold on to a secret, not tell somebody when we were asked not to tell somebody. We do battle because the flesh says, oh, I just need to tell somebody. And then I'll tell so and so and ask them to pray about it. So we even find us a good excuse for why we tell somebody because we just got to get it out of the bag, right? See, that's the flesh. That's the flesh. Oh, my God, we wrestle with it. I bet you there's more secrets told than we can imagine where people says, I'm going to tell you a secret, but make sure you do not repeat it. Do you hear? Yes, I hear. And then you tell them, and then they go tell somebody. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret, but you make sure you do not repeat it. Okay. Then they go, <laughs> pretty soon 18 people knows about your secret. <laughs> yeah, Jesus spread the gospel with it. I like that. He would tell people, don't tell them what I did, and they would go tell. So he spread the gospel by telling the people not to tell. You might get it spread further by telling somebody not to tell it than to tell it. <laughs> That's ridiculous, but I get it. <laughs> oh, we are disciples of Jesus. Amen? Disciple means a true follower. A true follower. And we belong to him, and we live to do the things which please him. That's what we live for. How many of you want to please the Lord? How many of you want the Lord to be satisfied with you? How many of you want to live your life in such a manner that you make God happy? See, we lived at one time in life, we didn't care how God felt. Now I do care how God feels. I care more about how God feels about me than I do any person or human being on this earth, and you should too. You should care more about what God thinks about you than any other human being on this earth because he's the one that really matters nobody else may not like you sometimes do you feel like nobody else really likes you maybe you don't fit in anywhere but guess what that may be you and it may even be true but what's important if God says you're mine I love you 
That's all that matters. That's enough love to take care of any love itch we got. Amen? Amen. Well, you don't love me, but Jesus does. That's enough for me. How many of you will say that's enough for me? Woo, glory. That's enough for me. Jesus' love is enough for me. Some people feel they're incomplete if they don't have a man. Or they're incomplete if they don't have children. Or they're incomplete. Come on. Everybody say, Jesus is enough for me. Jesus is enough for me. Amen? Mm. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. In Romans, and if you ever want to read a lot about what we're talking about today, it's in Romans 6. You could read the whole chapter. It's, it's um, got about 23 verses, but it ends with this. The wages of sin is death. Death there means eternal separation from God. It also means doom and destruction. So if we live this life on this earth, as servants of sin and if we live our life practicing sin and if we never turn from our sin and believe on Jesus and accept him as our Lord and Savior we will forever be slaves to sin and eventually there will come a payday for the life we have lived and this is what it says the payday is the wages of sin the payment for sin is Death, And that word death means eternal death, damnation, condemnation, judgment, sentence, doom, destruction, torment, forever and ever and ever. Let me tell you what, every soul is going to live forever and ever somewhere. You're never going to die. We are never going to die. Only your body, only your flesh returns to the dust of the earth. But our soul and spirit will live forever either with the Lord or with Satan. Hell was only created for one reason, for Satan And the angels that were cast out of heaven with him. He took a third of the angels and they followed him. And they rebelled against God. And Satan and a third of the angels of heaven were cast out of heaven. And they were put in. God created a place for him. He said, hell's yours. In other words, he's already sentenced Satan. His his future, he knows it. Satan knows this moment that his future is eternally in the lake of fire and brimstone. And what he's trying to do today, he hates God. Therefore, he hates every person who becomes a child of God through faith in Jesus. We know he can't do anything against God, and we know he can't do anything against Jesus, but he comes with fury against the children of God. And that's okay. God will take care of us. Okay, that's okay, because God's got our back. Come on, God's got my back. Everybody say, God's got my back. He's got you all the way around. Amen? The Bible says he's able to keep you and present you faultless before the glory of his Father. I got chill bumps on that one. (laughs) I could feel the Spirit. Amen? But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. God gave us the best gift. He, when he gave us Jesus, when he sent his only begotten son to die on that cross, and now all we have to do is receive the gift of God, eternal life, by taking up our cross and following Jesus, living every day for him here that we might inherit Eternal life. And this is what God created us to be. You'll never find out what God created you to be apart from God who created you. Do you know how many people are living a life that they were not created to live? Do you know how many 
people are living a life and it's miserable. They're miserable. Many are broken. Many are where you may have been in your younger years before you got born again. Maybe you were broken, busted, disgusted, fed up, didn't want to live anymore. Wouldn't care if you died and fell off the earth. Things had gotten so bad because why? You were a servant of sin and Satan was your master. He's evil. Evil. If people could only know how evil he is, they would quickly submit to Jesus if they just knew how good he, he is. We need to tell people about how good Jesus is. I tell you what, you, I would never go back. There is nothing that I ever want to go back to. I would never. You couldn't pay me all the money this world has. If you were to be able to stack up the money that is in this world today and put it in a pile and give it to me to trade my salvation for it, I would spit on your money. That's how much I love my Lord. That's how much I love my Jesus. This world has nothing for me. I do not love this world. I get fed up with this world. I sort of feel like righteous Lot. He was vexed with the city. His very spirit was sorely vexed by the evil works that the people were doing under the power of Satan. It said Lot, he was just, he was grieved. He was vexed in his spirit because daily he had to watch what people were doing and listen to what they were saying. And he was ready to get out. And God sent the angels in at the appointed time and rescued Lot and destroyed Sodom, and God's fixing to do it again. God's going to send Jesus this time, and Jesus is going to come in the clouds, and he's going to take the church, the true body of Christ, out of this wicked world, and then he's going to let Satan have his field day on the people here in that time for seven years before he returns for the second coming. And then Satan will be bound for 1,000 years until finally at the end of 1,000 years, he'll be loosed for a season to fulfill another purpose, but eventually he will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That will be his abode. That is his abode. See, if we know who he is in his future, also he's trying to take with him as many men and women as he can, but that's not our proper abode. God sent Jesus to die for all of us. Our proper abode as human beings is not hell. God did not even create hell for one man or woman, but hell is enlarged today because it's making room for men and women that are going because they refuse to submit themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. They refuse to come out from under that sin slave mentality and submit themselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. You have to submit to God before you can ever resist the devil. See, people's like, well, I'll resist the devil. No, you won't. You'll remain a slave unto sin. But once you humble yourself and you bow your heart, bow your head, bow your knee, get down on your hands and knees if you have to, and make it real. Ask the Lord, forgive me of my sins. I have rebelled against you. I have done evil. I have said things I shouldn't. I have thought thoughts that were wicked. I have sinned, Jesus, and I'm sorry, and I want a new start in life. I want to be your child. Will you please take me in? And when you pray with a fervent heart and a sincere, all it takes is a sincere heart. doesn't matter what you've done. We've all sinned. 
Sin is sin. I hear people say, God can never forgive me. <laughs> yes, he could. That's pride speaking. Pride makes you think you've committed more sin than everybody else. That's not true. He's a merciful, kind, loving, tender, forgiving, gracious father. And his son is just like him. And they love us. They love us. Jesus loves not just the little children, the big children. Jesus loves big people. Some people don't even ever get saved till they're 80, 90 years old. Do you know some people never, ever come out from being a slave of sin until they're 80 or 90 years old, some on their deathbed. But aren't we running a risk by waiting that long? Isn't that not very smart? Today is the day of salvation. Choose you this day whom you will serve. There it is. Will you serve the Lord? If not, you will serve Satan. And you will be a slave unto sin. Uh, we can be slaves unto righteousness or slaves unto sin. Amen. I've made my choice. It was the best choice I've ever made. And I wouldn't change it for anything. I want to admonish anyone who hears this word today. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He's waiting patiently for one more bound up slave to humbly cry out to Him, forgive me and save me. I believe Jesus is listening in the earth this morning, today, for that one humble cry, forgive me. And if you will cry out to the Lord, he will hear and he will forgive and he will save. Amen. God bless you. We hope you were blessed by today's message. For more messages or to contact us, visit our Facebook page at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. And we encourage you to share this message with a friend and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ.